Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 28 years, we have offered voices of conscience, key issues in ethical perspective. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of today's program. It's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker in our spring 2009 season, journalist Tom Jelton. Mr. Jelton is national security correspondent for NPR, reporting on defense policy, military affairs, terrorism, and espionage. He has reported on the wars in Central and South America, the Persian Gulf and Croatia and Bosnia, and he covered the breakup of the Soviet Union and the transition to democracy in Eastern Europe. In recent years, he has reported extensively on Cuba, and his latest book, Bacardi and the Long Struggle for Cuba offers a thorough and insightful history of modern Cuba. Mr. Jelton appears regularly on the PBS program Washington Week and has written for the New Republic, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. His years of covering international news from Washington, D.C. and points around the world provide him with a unique perspective on the topic of today's forum the national security challenges facing the Obama administration. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, distinguished journalist, native son, and graduate of the University of Minnesota, Tom Jelton. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. No. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love that introduction. It, you know, I worry a little bit. Uh, I come back to Minnesota so often, I basically jump at the chance to come back here as often as I can. And I, and I do worry a little bit uh, about getting o overexposed here. But um, Tim, that was just a really gracious introduction. Uh, and what a treat it is to be in this spectacular venue. I hope people listening on, on the, uh, uh, to NPR get a chance to see this beautiful church at some point. It's really, it's really a treat to be able to stand here and, and, and speak in, uh, in the, uh, surrounded by, by this beauty. Um, I really do enjoy these opportunities to get out and to the real world and talk to people and to pontificate uh, about the issues. Uh, you know, I, about a couple times a week, uh, we get a chance to opine uh, on the radio. We have these segments where the host of a program will interview uh, a reporter about some story that he or she is covering. Uh, but you know, those only go on for about four minutes, and you're keeping one eye on the countdown clock all the time. Uh, and th that's bad, and what makes it worse is when the host, as he or she sometimes does, asks you a question that you're not entirely prepared for, and you have about two seconds to come up with an answer that makes you sound semi-intelligent, and that's not easy. It is so much more fun to be in a venue like this where I actually can talk about the news uh, at a little bit of, of length, and as I say, particularly back here uh, in my home state. And I know that Westminster is just a great lecture series. Uh, I heard that from my wife, Martha Raditz, who was here a couple of years ago. Uh, I am humbled uh, to follow not only in her footsteps, but in the trail of so many other great speakers. And I see from your program that you're going to have my good friend Gwen Eiffel here next month. Uh, she will be just a treat. She's got a new book out on uh, black political leadership in this country, uh, and I hope you come back to see Gwen. She will be just terrific. But seriously, these are really great opportunities for us journalists. You know, I was actually invited to speak in Houston uh, four months ago, just after the election, about this same topic, national security challenges facing the Obama administration. In that case, it was national security challenges facing the new Obama administration. And uh, I, uh, I welcomed that assignment. This is what they wanted me to talk about. Uh, because as you know, this had been a really hot issue during the election campaign, especially during the primary campaign when it was raised uh, first and most effectively uh, by Hillary Clinton. And the question, as you recall, uh, that Hillary Clinton raised in the context of that campaign struggle was, would Barack Obama be prepared for the global crises that he was sure to face? And the question was, would he be prepared at 3 o'clock in the morning when that phone call came 
with the news of some crisis for which he was not, be, uh, not prepared? Would he be able to handle it? So uh, when I spoke in Houston just after the election, that was the way I framed my talk. I said, okay, if he's going to get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning, where is that call going to come from? What is, the, what is the crisis that he is most likely, that a new president, Barack Obama, is most likely to be faced with at three o'clock in the morning? And I came up with some logical answers. Um, I rank them in the order of the seriousness of the crisis that he was likely to face and the likelihood. And the, the list that came up with were, number one, a terrorist attack from Al-Qaeda. Uh, we know that Al-Qaeda has often been tempted to strike a new administration in the first few months of taking office. We saw this in 1993 with the first attack on the World Trade Center. We saw it in 2001 under George Bush. Uh, you know, new administrations are times of great vulnerability for a country because they're just getting their team together. So this was, as I figured, this was the, the most serious and perhaps the most likely crisis that Barack Obama would face. The second one was a, a destabilizing crisis in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, a nuclear-armed country, very weak, unstable government, um, under threat from radical Islamists. The third one was Iran, you know, the possibility of uh, government Ahmadinejad, President Ahmadinejad, testing Obama with, with, with some uh, confrontational kind of uh, move. Uh, another one was Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, testing Obama. And the fifth one that I anticipated or, or suggested was a likely crisis was uh, North Korea. And here the, the most likely crisis that I laid out was the, was the death of Kim Jong-il, the leader of North Korea. He had disappeared from sight a few months earlier. There were a lot of questions about whether he was even alive or whether he was incapacitated. And the point being that if in fact he were to die, there would be a serious succession crisis, a potentially destabilizing crisis in North Korea, which is also a uh, nuclear country. So those were my top five scenarios for that 3 a.m. phone call. Now, none of these threats, of course, have gone away. In fact, some of them are even more pressing now than they seemed to be last November. We know that Pakistan has just come through yet another dangerous crisis. The, 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 the problem between uh, Zadari and, and, um, and, and Sharif, the, his main op uh, opponent, uh, was averted for the, for the time being, but it now appears that uh, the Asif Zadari government may not be able to last more than a few more months. Uh, we have uh, a missile test coming up within a couple of weeks, in all likelihood, in North Korea. Uh, we just learned that Russia is likely to or wants to position, deploy strategic bombers in Cuba and Venezuela. So these, these crises that I mentioned are still there. But remember, the whole premise of that issue, the 3 a.m. phone call, was that it was likely to be a surprise. It was likely to be something for which Barack Obama was not prepared. And guess what? As it turns out, the top national security challenge facing this new administration now is one that was not on that list. It was a, a crisis for which he arguably was not prepared. The Director of National Intelligence, Dennis Blair, went before Congress last month to deliver the intelligence community's annual assessment of security threats facing the United States, and he began with this line. The primary near-term security concern of the United States is the global economic crisis. The number one threat to our national security, surpassing terrorism, surpassing radical Islam, surpassing nuclear proliferation, the official number one security threat that we're facing is the global economic crisis. This is not the world that we were facing six months ago. It is not the world that our intelligence agencies and governments were preparing for. It is not the world that the Barack Obama administration was preparing for, even when it took office. Uh, and so this is basically what I want to, the way I want to sort of change my remarks today to sort of focus on this new situation where the intelligence community is now telling us that the global economic crisis is the most serious security threat facing the United States. Now, um, as 
Pastor Hart Anderson said, I am technically the NPR intelligence correspondent, or have been up until now, but those of you who listen regularly to NPR may have noticed that in the past three weeks, I've actually changed my reporting assignment. I have actually been focusing almost exclusively on the international economic situation. For the time being, at least, this is my new assignment. The way that this economic crisis is now reverberating internationally and threatening our security and security of countries around the world. So I will go back to these five threats that I mentioned at the top. Uh, as I say, they haven't gone away, but I think it's very important for us to understand how threatening this financial crisis is right now in a geopolitical sense. And basically, here's what's happened. This is a crisis, as you know, that began as a financial crisis. It started out in the banking sector having to do with uh, a freeze up in the credit markets and an inability of banks and, and companies to borrow and to lend. Uh, but then it was soon transformed into, from a financial crisis, into an economic crisis, which is somewhat different. And now this economic crisis has become so serious that it has transformed into a security crisis. And this is where we are today. The, and I, I distinguish between financial crisis and economic crisis because as long as it was a financial crisis, it was basically just centered in the banking sector. But once it spread out into the entire economy, what you saw was the whole economy of the world beginning to suffer, beginning to shrink. The World Bank now says that the global economy this year will actually shrink. Uh, now you have to consider that the global population is increasing at a pretty significant rate. So a shrinking of the, national uh, the international economy, the global economy, has tremendous repercussions. The International Labor Organization says that as many as 50 million jobs will be wiped out around the world this year. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's going to be the developing countries that are hurt the most. Uh, net private capital flows to the developing world this year, 2009, will be one-fifth of what they were just two years ago in 2007. These have been the high growth economies in the developing world. Uh, and their growth has been sustained uh, by all this foreign capital that has been coming in. And all of a sudden, it just dries up. Uh, that, is the, that is what produces this global economic crisis. Now, every downturn, every economic downturn has social and political consequences. When people are thrown out of work, uh, when there are economic problems in a country, you get civil unrest, uh, 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 you get uh, the potential of civil war, and naturally, it's, it's more dangerous in those countries that already had problems uh, that were already unstable. Remember back in 2002, President Bush was talking about the axis of evil, uh, basically North Korea, Iran, Iraq. Well, the economist Neil Ferguson has cleverly come up with a new concept to replace the axis of evil. It is now the axis of upheaval. He's talking about all these countries that are now serious hotspots around the world precisely because of the global financial crisis. And if you look, at the areas of the world that are uh, clearly hotbeds for the development of terrorism, in almost every case, they are areas where the economic problems are aggravating the situation. As I say, this is a pattern we've seen many times before, and we'll see it again. Every time there is a global economic downturn, there are consequences. But the intelligence community would not rank this economic crisis as the most serious security threat today if it were just another economic downturn. This is qualitatively different. This global economic crisis could change the world in fundamental ways. Uh, it could change the world geopolitically for the foreseeable future, perhaps more than any other single force on the planet. And this is the reason that, this that the economic situation in the world right now is getting so much attention uh, among intelligence officers and intelligence analysts. It really is a once-in-a-lifetime event. The changes that result in the world from this crisis will be deep, they will be far-reaching, and they will be long-lasting. Uh, one reason that the impact of this crisis is likely to be so great is because it 
is taking on a kind of a self-perpetuating aspect that can be very hard to escape. Economic crises, as I say, produce political crises, but then political crises in turn can produce new economic crises. If you look, for example, at Pakistan right now, Pakistan is suffering tremendous economic problems. It's basically just getting along from month to month uh, its, its foreign uh, currency revert reserves are dangerously low. It's getting big bailouts from the International Monetary Fund, uh, and that is the only way that the, company is hold that the country is holding itself together. Uh, that economic struggle in Pakistan is no doubt exacerbating, exacerbating the political tensions in the country and paving the way for uh, hardline nationalists or Islamists to come to power. Uh, the logical conclusion of this developing nationalism uh, in India, in Pakistan, is the, is the increase of tensions between Pakistan and India. Uh, I was told uh, by a senior intelligence officer not long ago that if there were another attack like the one that we saw in Mumbai uh, in India that can, be a tra that can be traced to Pakistani elements, the prospect of a war between India and Pakistan would be 75%. But then you can imagine if there, were be, if there were to be a war between India and Pakistan, how that would then worsen the economic situation, not only in Pakistan, but in entire South Asia. So you get this cycle, this vicious cycle developing between economic crises and political crises and security crises. And, and as I see, studying this dynamic uh, between the economic crisis and the national security situation is really the hot thing in Washington right now. There's, there's a congressional hearing uh, on this um, in one committee or another uh, just about every week with all kinds of experts testifying, uh, and I've covered, covered several of these, of these hearings. At one of these hearings a couple of weeks ago, uh, one of the experts made a point of saying there actually are some positive things uh, to emerge from this crisis. He pointed out, for example, that high unemployment means that it's easier for the military to recruit because, you know, if you're having a hard time finding a job, then the military maybe looks a little better. Well, I thought that was a little bit of a feeble argument. Um, I don't know how many of you watch ABC television where my wife works, but uh, you may have seen Martha had a report on just last night from Mosul in northern Iraq. She interviewed a soldier there who in the last five years has been deployed three times to Iraq and twice to Afghanistan. And she asked him, what significant events he had missed in his family's life uh, over these last five years. And he said pretty much all of them. Christmases, birthdays, uh, you know, his children growing up. So that is not, it may be true that unemployment makes it easier for the military to recruit, but the prospect of continued deployments in Africa, in, in, in Iraq, and in Afghanistan is certainly a force that works in the other direction. Now, another plus uh, of this economic crisis that this, this expert mentioned was food prices going down. Well, in fact, I think this is a legitimately positive uh, development from this. In fact, about a year ago, we at NPR were preparing a big reporting project on the food crisis around the world and how the increase in food prices was really threatening, again, the stability of a lot of, of, of poor countries. There is no question one consequence of this economic crisis has been that commodity prices, including food prices, have come down quite significantly. That is undeniably a positive benefit. Also, oil prices have come down. Remember just eight months ago, uh, last July, we were looking at $4 a gallon gasoline. The, but, I mean, the, the negative part of this is that the reason oil prices came down is precisely because of the, of the economic recession, declining demand. Uh, brought those prices down. Uh, another sort of semi-positive effect of this decline in oil prices has been that some of the regimes in the world who have been most affected by this decline in oil prices have been some of the more thuggish regimes in the world. I mean, if you look at Venezuela, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, um, he had been acting very aggressively towards his neighbors. And in his government, the Chavez government in Venezuela was really propped up by by its uh, revenue from oil experts, exports, which have gone down quite dramatically. If you look at Iran, you may notice in the last few months, actually, 
sort of the rhetoric coming out of Iran has been significantly moderated. This again is probably a reaction to declining oil revenues. Iran is also a big oil exporter uh, and it has made the declining income from oil has made the government in Iran a little bit more amenable to international pressure. You could also look at Russia. Russia has not exactly been an example of, of uh, civilized and enlightened governance in the last uh, uh, couple of years, and Russia has also been seriously affected uh, by the decline in oil revenues. But, but it's not always true that a, that a um, troublesome country becomes less troublesome uh, when it has suffered an economic setback. Uh, I mean, Vladimir Putin and his allies have, if anything, become more aggressive uh, in the last few months since the Russian economy tanked. Uh, they become more anti-American. They become more ruthless in dealing with their own opponents. The, you know, the big the big danger here is that when governments, when countries suffer economic stress, the more unscrupulous leaders will attempt to divert the anger of their citizens away from their economic situation toward external enemies. You get this kind of scapegoating phenomenon, and that can take on very dangerous dimensions. Um, I. Uh, reported extensively, of course, the war in the former Yugoslavia. You know, and one of the prevailing ideas out there is that this war sort of just uh, erupted from ethnic hatreds, long, uh, long suppressed ethnic hatreds, which is partly true, but the event that really provoked that war was actually the economic decline of Yugoslavia in the 1980s. The, you know, Western governments used to love Marshal Tito, the, the head of Yugoslavia during the communist period, because he was not allied with either Russia or China. And so the West, including the United States, saw this as a government that we needed to prop up. And so we showered the Yugoslav state with cheap credits and loans. And that was what the Yugoslav economy was based on. After Tito died and after we began to see these political changes, all of a sudden we didn't care. We in the West didn't care about Yugoslavia anymore. Those loans and credits dried up. The Yugoslav economy went into very sharp decline. Slobodan Milosevic, the, the leader of, of Yugoslavia at that time, seeing his own political position really deteriorating, convinced the Serbs in the former Yugoslavia that their problems were, do, were to be blamed on the Croats or the Muslims. You saw the president of Croatia, Franjo Tudjman, telling his people that their problems were bl to be blamed on the Serbs. So that was the context in which the war in the former Yugoslavia erupted. It really had its origins in the economic decline uh, of Yugoslavia. So this is something that we have seen over and over again in the history of the world, that uh, when, you've get, when you get real economic unrest, it often produces uh, conflict, international conflict, because of this uh, scapegoating phenomenon. You saw the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany uh, in the late 1920s, and it, of course, spilled over into the United States in the 1930s. Today, Eastern Europe is going through some really difficult times, and what do you find? Once again, majorities of the populations in Hungary and Poland, for example, saying they think Jews have too much power uh, in their country. Uh, this is the same thing that we have seen over and over again. If we just take China uh, for a moment. Uh, China has a, is a rapidly changing country, of course. Uh, China has about 80 million migrant workers. These are workers who come from the countryside seeking jobs in the cities. And um, this financial downturn, if it plays out, could mean as many as 20 million migrant workers in China will find when they get to the city or while they're there that their jobs have disappeared and they will be faced with the prospect of having go back to go back to their villages in the countryside. We've already seen riots. We don't hear a lot about them in this country and they're of course not reported in China, but we've already seen riots in train depots in China when migrant workers are being shipped back to their to their villages in the countryside. Again, it's not hard to imagine a scenario with sort of continued financial downturn where the Chinese leadership is faced with the choice of repressing its own people or channeling, channeling their anger outward, and that could produce a conflict with neighbors. We could go on with a number of other countries where sort of variations of this scenario could spin out, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Somalia, uh, whether it's Turkey. You know, terrorism does not have its origins so much in, the, in despair 
as it has in disappointment. It's when people's expectations of better lives are not met that they really become angry, and that's when you see violence developing, and that's precisely the situation that we're in now with this shrinking economy and rising joblessness. Um, Mexico is another country that really needs to be considered very closely. You know that the drug cartels in Mexico are now really endangering the existence of the Mexican government. Uh, we've just seen uh, within the last month uh, the government of Mexico has actually dispatched the Mexican army to the city of Ciudad Juarez on the border to take over local security, to take over security functions from the local police because the local police had, had basically been wiped out by drug cartels. Uh, and the problem here is that the way that you can link this to the economic situation is that just as the government of Mexico needs more resources to fight this fight with the drug cartels, it finds its spending constrained by the declining revenues that it is getting like every other government. Governments around the world are finding their budgets strained by this economic crisis at the very time when their needs are the greatest. Uh, you know, an economic crisis, whether it's in this country or another country, means that governments have to spend more in in stimulus spending in order to try and revive the economy. There is a need for a stronger safety net because so many people are losing their jobs. There are security problems to deal with. All of these require more expenditures by the government and they're coming just at a time when government revenues uh, are shrinking. Now, in the United States, we're in a very advantageous situation because the U.S. dollar is seen as a safe haven around the world, and that means that the Treasury Department can sell U.S. government bonds on the open market, and people want to invest in the U.S. dollar right now because it is seen as safe. That means this gives us an opportunity to finance our own budgetary needs. Other governments do not have this option. Other governments cannot borrow to finance the kind of spending they need to deal with the, the situation they have right now. If you look at Eastern Europe, for example, you have seen a very sharp decline in the uh, value of the currencies that countries in Eastern Europe use relative to the euro uh, and other Western European currencies. Standards of living are going down, but those are not governments that are able to respond to this situation by borrowing more money uh, they could perhaps print more money, but this will just lead to rampant hyperinflation and sort of even worsen the situation. Uh, this Eastern Europe is right now uh, in a very fragile situation. The uh, U.S. Intelligence Committee, uh, every co community, every uh, five years puts out uh, an assessment of how they expect the world to look in the in in the future. And, this, and the last one came out last November, was how, the world, how they expect the world to look in the year 2025. And one of their findings, which really caught my attention, is they are very worried about creeping corruption in Eastern Europe. And they actually predict that one country in Eastern Europe, they do not say which, but they predict that one country in Eastern Europe by the year 2025 will have been taken over by organized crime. So this process, if anything else, this trend has, if anything else, been accelerated by this economic crisis that we're facing. Uh, so the financial crisis is actually changing the structure of the world, geopolitical structure of the world. We are now in a process of de-globalization. For the last couple of, of decades, the world has been moving, of course, toward more uh, economic integration. Now we are beginning to see signs that we're moving in the other direction. This year, 2009, world trade is likely to decline for the first time in decades since the early 1980s. Why does this happen? Why does world trade decline at a time like this? It's because countries pull back, they begin to feel insecure, governments feel that they need to protect their own people first, uh, and as a result, you get the development of trade protectionism, where governments try to protect their own industries from foreign competition. Uh, just uh, two days ago, the World Bank reported that 17 of the 20 major na nations that promised at the G20 summit in November to avoid protectionist steps have in fact done just the opposite. Just a couple of days ago, I reported on this latest flare-up between the United States and Mexico where the U.S. Congress has just voted to stop allowing Mexican trucks to enter the United States. Now, theoretically, there's a concern here about the safety of Mexican trucks, but what I found out 
is that a Department of Transportation study in recent years has found that, that fewer Mexican trucks have been taken off the road for safety violations than U.S. trucks. So this seems to be a, a really have to, this reaction seems to have much more to do with protecting the U.S. trucking industry. And in fact, here's what Senator Byron Dorgan, who is the author of this uh, from North Dakota, who is the author of this provision, said about Mexico when it then slapped import tariffs on products coming from the United States. He said, a country that has a $453 billion trade surplus with us has a lot of nerve to suggest that we are being unfair to them. In fact, our expectation should be that Mexico purchases much, much more from our country to restore some balance to our bilateral trade. Well, the truth is there is nothing in the rules of international trade that says that countries should not export any more than they import. You know, these things just sort of get played out in the marketplace. And this idea that somehow we should punish Mexico because it happens to export more to us than we export to them is, I think, a perfect example of a kind of a classically protectionist attitude. I don't need to tell you who have read anything about world history how the protectionism of the 1930s set the stage for the conflicts that led to World War II. And it's not just economic deglobalization that's taking place. We're also in a period of political deglobalization. We are seeing the return of the nation state and the decline of international institutions, whether it's the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, or the United Nations, or even the European Union. These international or regional institutions are finding that people don't believe in them anymore. There's a real crisis of confidence in these institutions. They look instead to their own individual governments. So we're seeing, at the same time that we're seeing the world sort of pull back economically, we're seeing the world pull back politically as well. And then we have these ideological issues being raised. Um, I mentioned Eastern Europe. You know, Eastern Europe, I covered this transition to democracy and market capitalism just 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago. People there had been living under socialism for 40 years, and they were, they were enthusiastic about this change. And they really looked to the West for inspiration. What has happened now in the last six months? Western Europe has basically turned their backs on the countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, and they are finding themselves isolated at this very moment. Now, you know, what is going to be the consequence of this when you sort of multiply a, a, around the world? You have, I think, the prospect that people will begin to sort of rethink what kind of economic system really is in their interests. Uh, you know, to the extent that China comes out on top, uh, China comes out ahead on this uh, as a result of this crisis, you know, are people going to be looking to the Chinese model as the one that makes more sense? If you look at Iceland, to take a, an example of a, of, a, of a totally Western country, when Iceland went through its financial crisis last fall, it looked first to the West for help, for bailout help, didn't get any. What was the country that came to Iceland's rescue? It was Russia. So one consequence of this might be some ideological realignment in the world and sort of some rethinking of uh, what model makes most sense. Now, when the dust settles, there is likely to be in the world a sort of a new political balance here. Uh, China is almost certainly, as I said, likely to be a winner. Um, uh, the uh, Chinese, the government of China does not have a huge debt overhang like we have. Uh, they have been acting very boldly to deal with the economic problems uh, that they are encountering. And experts are now saying that China is likely to be one of the first economies to recover uh, from this. Now, in terms of the China-U.S. relationship, I don't need to tell you that China owes one point, owns $1.3 trillion worth of U.S. dollar assets. This gives China a tremendous amount of leverage over the United States. We saw the extraordinary uh, example last week where the Prime Minister of China, Wen Jiabao, was lecturing the United States about its budget, saying, we are worried about our investment in the U.S. dollar, and we hope that you are a little bit more careful in your fiscal policies. Well, you know, what can the United States say? At this point, if it weren't for China financing our debt, uh, we could be facing dramatically higher interest rates. We would have a lot heart. We would, China is our main source of foreign capital with which we are financing our debt. 
The value of the U.S. dollar, if China were to sort of lose interest in buying U.S. treasuries, the value of the U.S. dollar could plunge. This would have devastating effects on all of us, on the value of our, of our retirement funds. It would uh, produce much higher interest rates. So China has this extraordinary leverage uh, on us uh, right now. Now, I think the United States, in some ways, is in a relatively better position than other countries in the world, but I think it is very hard at this point to see for sure how long this crisis is going to last and where, in the end, it, it settles, who is on top, who is losing positions of power and influence. But as I say, I think that what the one thing that we do know is that this financial crisis has, as I say, really reshaped the world in ways that raise uh, all kinds of new security threats. Now, to go back to the ones that I mentioned in the, in the beginning, they have not gone away. Al Qaeda remains determined to strike the United States. Uh, nothing has happened since 9-11 of consequence in the United States, but you know we came very close in the summer of 2006 when there was a plan, an Al-Qaeda plan, to blow up 10 air air airliners over the Atlantic. Uh, that would have actually produced about the same number of fatalities as in the World Trade Center collapse. Uh, fortunately, that was averted. Uh, and Al-Qaeda now has an added incentive to do something against the United States precisely because of the financial crisis. You know that after the 9-11 attacks, our economy went down by about 20, the stock markets went down by about 20 percent, but they, they came down from a position of strength. The U.S. economy was pretty strong at that point, and we recovered. If there were a terrorist attack now, with the economic situation we're in now, it really would have much more of a chance of sending the whole economy into kind of a meltdown. North Korea, another country I mentioned. You know, North Korea just this week informed the United States that it does not want to accept any more food assistance. Uh, and, you know, what analysts are saying is this indicates that North Korea is preparing for some kind of crisis. They, as I said before, there are preparations to launch uh, a, um, a missile, which theoretically is to test a satellite, but in fact, could also be testing a long-range missile that would have, at least in theory, the capability of delivering a nuclear weapon. Um, North Korea is in an extremely unstable situation right now. Uh, the, um, the, we still, Kim Jong-il, the leader of North Korea, has, seems to have, have come back, uh, but we don't know what kind of health he's in. And it appears that there is a lot of maneuvering going on inside the North Korean state. You know, the North Korean, even though it's a communist dictatorship, it's like a monarchy. The ruler of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, is the son of Kim Il-sung, the first ruler, and, and, and Kim Jong-il's most likely successors are also members of his family. But, you know, there are no institutions that can sort of moderate the inevitable instability and crises that would go uh, with a, a, a succession uh, challenge in North Korea. Uh, I have to just share with you one thing I saw in an intelligence report just this week. Uh, last week they had an election in North Korea. They elected delegates to the, to the parliament and 99.9% .9 of the North Korean voters voted in these elections. Of course, they all voted for the government candidate. And in, U.S. intelligence analysts are actually able to take an election like this and glean something from it. They, don't, of course, don't look at who won. Um, but as it turns out that under these election rules, there's supposed to be one delegate to this parliament elected for every 100,000, every 10,000 citizens. And what they found is that the number of delegates that were elected uh, as a result of this election was the same as had been elected in 1993. And so what, they, what U.S. intelligence agencies concluded from this is that the adult population in North Korea today is the same as it was in 1993. Think of this, considering all the, you know, babies being born in North Korea, the only way that you could have the adult population stay the same is, in the words of this intelligence report that I, that I saw, it means North Korea's leaders are allowing their elderly and sick to die. Early indicator that there is some real serious crisis developing in North Korea. Um, and there are all kinds of speculations about why North Korea is choosing this moment to test this missile, which I can address in a, in a Q&A. Uh, now, I can't talk about succession issues without mentioning the country that I follow most closely, that it seems nobody cares about much anymore, and that is Cuba. 
we have had this extraordinary situation in Cuba over the last year and a half uh, where we don't know for sure whether Fidel Castro is in any kind of, uh, has any kind of physical or mental capacity to continue to bear an influence. We don't know if he's been sidelined by his brother Raul. We don't know what's going to happen in Cuba in the future. Uh, I have, whenever people ask me about this, I always say I really am humbled by trying to understand Cuba. It's a very difficult place to understand. And now we have just had this development in the last week where the three people who were most likely successors to the Cuban, to Raul Castro, when Ra Raul Castro finally disappears, all three have been pushed out of their positions. This leaves Cuba without any likely successors sort of evident. And all the Cuban experts who had been predicting that this guy Carlos Laje or Felipe Perez Roque or Jose Luis Rodriguez would be the ones that would be taking power now have to acknowledge they don't know what's going on. The one thing that this, that this development does show is that the Cuban leaders, Raul Castro, Fidel Castro, and those close to him are very short-term focused. They're focused on sort of the immediate consolidation of power in the short term. They are making no plans for the future. And this leads, this sets the stage for a very serious succession crisis in Cuba as well. And one of the things that we know from history is that when authoritarian governments uh, go through a succession crisis, inevitably it produces all kinds of, of instability, ranging from refugee outflows to unrest in the streets and so forth. So Cuba right now seems to be facing uh, a real critical situation. I have completely emptied my notebook uh, today. This is basically everything I know about everything that's going on in the world, and I think you do have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom Jelton. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, originating from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, senior minister at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is journalist Tom Jelton. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience at Westminster, I'd like to thank the radio audience for their support of the forum and invite them to join us on April 16th for a presentation by Gwen Eiffel moderator of the PBS program, Washington Week, who will reflect on the age of Obama. Details are available at eWestminster.org. The spring season of the forum is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Donald Morrison Meisel, pastor of this church from 72 to 1992, one of the founders of the Westminster Town Hall Forum. He was the voice of the forum for more than 12 years. And now, Tom Jelton, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. I'd have to begin with one simply asking you personally how you get up in the morning knowing all that you know about the crises in the world and face each day. Well, you know, um, one of the things is at home, particularly with my wife doing what she does, is that we avoid all talk of, of the world and we focus on, on school news and on you know, cleaning the house and on what we'd like to do in the yard and when we're going to open the swimming pool, we really sort of focus on things that we, we can actually do something about. Uh -huh. <laughs> First question, do you see massive starvation in some developing countries due to the economic crisis? Uh, I think, you're, well, you're already seeing that in Sudan, of course. Uh, you're seeing it uh, in North Korea. Uh, I think the fact that North Korea has turned away, you know, the, the World Food program says that one-third of the population in North Korea is right now dependent on food aid and all of a sudden, as I say, just this week, the government, for whatever reason, has de decided to reject all food aid. That endangers immediately the health of one-third of the adult population uh, in North Korea. And if you look in parts of Africa, if you look in the Congo, what's going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo right now, there are clearly a number of countries where that is, unfortunately, a serious prospect. Former Vice President Cheney recently said that President Obama has made the U.S. more vulnerable to a terrorist attack. What are your thoughts about this? <laughs> uh, 
Well, all I, all I can tell you is that that is actually, you know, one of the interesting things about the Obama transition is that the vast majority of the national security apparatus has basically been carried over from the Bush administration. Not only uh, Defense Secretary Robert Gates, but 95% of the intelligence community, of course, the entire U.S. military has been carried over. So you're, you're talking about an establishment in charge of U.S. national security that was basically also in charge under President Bush. And I do not hear that from the people that I talk to in the intelligence world. Just to give you one quick example so we can move on, uh, President, one of the things that Vice President Cheney was talking about is the decision to close Guantanamo. The assessment that I've gotten, the detention facility in Guantanamo, Cuba, the assessment that I've gotten from talking to U.S. intelligence analysts is that whatever cost this has in terms of, you know, possibly letting some terrorists loose again, uh, the costs are more than outweighed by the benefits that will come to the U.S. image around the world by closing Guantanamo. That Guantanamo had been like a recruiting message for radicals around the world, the existence of that detention facility. And this, as I say, this is not my personal view. This is the assessment of the counterterrorism professionals who had those same positions under President Bush. As you know, Tom, we have students here from Perpich Center for the Arts, a school in Minneapolis. One of them asks, what country, in your opinion, will be least affected by the fall of the global economy? And a follow-up, do you think that the U.S. will lose its spot as the number one country? I think the United States will definitely lose its spot as the number one country economically. Uh, China uh, has moved up in the last few years. It was number four. It moved up to number three. Uh, just behind Japan, and just within the last year, if you measure the size of the economy by the purchasing power that that economy has, China has now moved up to number two. And the projections are that China will pass the United States in terms of its economic power within the next few years. Now, political power is something else. I think the United States, as I said before, the U.S. dollar is still seen as the safest investment in the world. I think politically, the United States will maintain uh, its position of power and influence, but there's no question that economically we are being overtaken. Uh, and as far as the question about, I, I, boy, Europe, Europe is actually in, in a, if anything, a more, uh, a more fragile state than we are right now. I don't know which country is, uh, for various reasons, each of them have their own problems. Britain is the center of the international financial system, and it has suffered grievously because of that. Spain and Italy have tremendous unemployment problems, and because they're part of the euro currency, they are not able to borrow money or print money in order to do stimulus spending. They're in bad shape. Uh, Germany is probably the strongest uh, because Germans have a tendency to save. They, you know, I was just in Germany last fall and I was amazed by the number of pe people. Germans don't even have faith in the stock market. They put their savings in like savings accounts. Uh, and they also, when they buy new cars, they tend to buy them with cash. Uh, and there was no housing bubble uh, in Germany to speak of. Housing prices barely kept pace with inflation over the last 10 years. So Germany has some serious banking problems, but I think from an economic point of view, it's probably in a stronger position. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and before the current global economic crisis, it appeared that communism, socialism were totally discredited and that the kind of capitalism practice in the West was the only viable economic system. What now? Well, I think that question is, people are asking that question and I don't know what the answer will be. Um, I have a friend who, uh, from Cuba who got a chance to go to Spain to study on a scholarship. And while she was in Spain, she had the opportunity to stay there and to get a work permit. And for most Cubans, this is a, an opportunity that they would dream of having. The Cuban, the Cuban economic situation is dire. But what she was looking at, this is in like January of this year, she looked at all the people that she met in Spain who were losing jobs and who had tremendous anxiety about their own future. And in that context, she actually decided to return to Cuba, not because she sort of saw great hope for her country or had pride in what was accomplished, but in Cuba, at least, it was a knowable situation. I mean, she knew that she was not going to lose her job in, back in Cuba. She would, knew that she would have some sort of minimal kind of safety, uh, education, health care, 
And in that moment, she actually decided it was less terrifying to go back to Cuba than it was to stay in Spain and sort of compete for available jobs with all the people in Spain that were unemployed. Now, I don't, I'm not, not sure what you can generalize from that, but I do think that in this moment of stress and anxiety, people are asking that question. This is extremely complicated with the econo economics and financial uh, issues being raised and that you're speaking about. How's the mass media doing in interpreting the crises in the world to the citizens of the world? <laughs> I think we at NPR are doing a terrific job, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a real challenge. It's one of the reasons that I actually jumped at this, at this opportunity is because I think one of the most challenging and potentially rewarding things for a journalist is to take a really complicated story and to explain it to people in a comprehensible way. That, if any, that is more than anything else in journalism what appeals to me professionally. And so I really sort of relish this opportunity, but it's extremely hard. Uh, you know, we had this example yesterday where the U.S. Treasury engaged in quantitative easing. The quantitative easing that the U.S. Treasury did yesterday is extremely important, but how do you explain what quantitative easing means, you know, in a couple of minutes? It's pretty hard. It is hard, and we're almost out of time here. Can you uh, conclude with one last question? What is it that gives you hope as you look at the vast array of bad news you've talked about? What do you find hope in? I have to be very careful how I say this, uh, not to sound partisan, but I actually think that this Obama administration objectively creates the situation where the image of the United States can really improve in the world. There has been so much animosity directed toward the United States in the last few years, so much anti-Americanism, whether it's in Europe or Latin America or in Asia. I think. I think, that without getting into his ideology or politics, I think the fact that America was able to elect a black man with a Muslim father and a Hussein as a middle name is such a testament to the character of this nation that I think it really has caused people around the world to sort of rethink the biases that they had. Thank you, Tom Jelton. Thank you. Thank you.